All right, welcome everybody. Happy uh, Thursday afternoon out here. Uh, I'll uh, just do a couple quick uh, opening remarks to the MIT uh, finance track. Uh, also wanted you to point out we have some events coming up. We had a great happy hour yesterday uh, and we, we have, uh, we'll do more of those where we'll have thematic uh, little breakouts in there and uh, got some great events. We've got a, uh, a, a Techstars founded company gonna teach us about estate planning. Um, we've got year in, we've got a MIT alum's gonna do a financial swim test for you guys, swim test training. So anyway, so uh, real quick about the MIT club for those of you not aware. Um, so we basically uh, close to 16,000 alum, many events, it's all volunteer led. So, you know, please, uh, please jump in and get involved guys. There's, there's a lot of great stuff we can do. Um, but I will, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Arnold now, the moderator for the event and uh, take, and I'll let you take it from here, Arnold. Um, hi everybody, uh, welcome for joining us for this uh, event this afternoon. I appreciate uh, taking the time. Um, uh, I am uh, working as a volunteer for the MIT uh, Club of North California uh, for this event. Um, and also, I, I also volunteer for a professional group called the Asian Financial Society. Asian Financial Society has been active for more than 30 years and is based uh, primarily out of New York. So I think this is a great opportunity to bring together uh, professionals from uh, finance and technology and also from East Coast and West Coast. So. Uh, uh, this will be a, 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 a new uh, 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 event format that, that we'll be trying out. So um, I, I look forward to a, a very exciting discussion with Professor Pentland. Uh, myself, I've worked in the, both um, software technology and finance, uh, both on the Wall Street and in government. And um, I, I learned about Professor Pentland from the uh, AI conference earlier this year and um, read about his uh, very interesting work developing this concept on the data union. So, um, so we have more conversation and I uh, feel this is, a, this is a, a novel concept that might help uh, power some of the future, um, let's say revitalization, revitalization or reinvention of our um, uh, community that we're gonna need coming out of the, uh, the slowdown we're hitting in the, uh, COVID crisis that we're in currently. So uh, I'm very eager to um, start the conversations. And um, please remember that uh, this uh, event is uh, being recorded and will be available for viewing later uh, on. And um, uh, we will have a chat function for you to uh, enter in uh, any questions you may have. And uh, we will um, collate them and uh, present it to professor at, uh, at the appropriate time. Um, the two in each session, uh, the second half of the uh, of the event. So um, uh, let me give a brief introduction to Professor Pentland. Uh, I think uh, many of you uh, know him already. He, uh, he has been well known and very active in the MIT community, being one of the uh, co-founder for the uh, MIT Media Lab, and, and um, he has also voted a, a lifetime achievement award from the. Uh, MIT club uh, earlier this year too. Uh, so um, aside from the many uh, uh, software uh, innovations, uh, he is uh, taking a four leadership positions in uh, these area of uh, intersection between technology and community. And so uh, I look forward to uh, learning much more about this uh, uh, today. So um, please, uh, Professor Pentland, uh, um, Good. The stage Good. is yours. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give about a 20 minute sort of overview of this idea. Uh, it really changes the way you think about, hopefully, the way you think about finance and investing in, in data in various ways. So I'm going to do a little bit of PowerPoint here just to get started. Let's see what we got here. Okay. And make it work. Okay, so there we, I am. Uh, I'm very proud of the little drawing that's the, by the person that does all those drawings in the, in the New Yorker. And I run a group at uh, MIT. I'm both in the media lab and in, in engineering. Uh, the connection science is the one in engineering and it's a, an alliance of large uh, uh, corporations, but also international organizations and uh, 
uh, countries. So we have several countries that are members trying to think about uh, how do you do privacy preserving identity systems, uh, safe computing, and, and how you use that stuff. So just a little advertisement, what we do is develop open source pre-standard software. Um, the very first thing from our group was uh, uh, Kerberos. We managed the open source Kerberos uh, uh, implementation, so 85% of all authentication on the web came out of things we do. We help develop um, OpenID Connect and, and Mobile ID. And uh, recently, we uh, spun up a national, helped spin up a national system for Switzerland, which is a blockchain system for data exchange, medical, financial, etc., which is pretty interesting. Uh, we had a spin out that was supported by Fidelity called a Koya, which is for moving retirement benefits and other investments around between major banks uh, without revealing uh, personal data unnecessarily. And we work with Intuit on some of their internal systems, which are uh, secure, uh, uh, privacy preserving uh, systems. Um, so I like this little uh, uh, cartoon, you know, Google and Facebook drilling for oil, because data is the new oil, all that sort of silliness. Um, but the serious part is, is that people don't trust data and AI in the economy. They don't trust it to act in their interest. Uh, so you hear all this stuff about bias and the robot overlords and so forth. Um, and there's real concern, and you're seeing this in, in litigation and the government acting uh, today. Uh, people want to have a more of a sense of control and trust, particularly in outcomes of how data is used. Uh, so it's like, I don't really care if you have my data, but it depends what you use it for, right? I want that to be in my interest, not necessarily... Uh, only in your interest. And uh, a phrase I developed many years ago is a new deal on data. So a new way of thinking about data, a new regulation about it. I ran a group at Davos for the World Economic Forum that ended up creating GDPR. Um, and uh, it was about the idea that people should be able to know what's happening to their data and have some control over that. Uh, and of course, like all legislative processes, it's complicated. Uh, California's law is a little better. Uh, we'll see, we'll get to the, the promised land someday. But I'll tell you a little bit how to, to get to a better place with data and finance uh, and this little talk. So the, the key from my point of view is to think of da data like capital, labor, and land. It's a primary method of production. And if you look at capital, you look at labor, you look at land, these are all regulatory, regulated. Um, they're all things that are audited. They're all things where there are ownership rights. Not necessarily full ownership, but, but, but ownership rights, ability to control. And um, I think capital has, uh, uh, sorry, data has entered this, this set of major fundamental production uh, 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 characteristics or, or methods. And I'll quote uh, Thomas Pitykey, who, who I would pick uh, nits with on several things, but one of the things he said is, large returns to capital is not bad in itself. The problem is that it's in too few hands. And I'll just substitute the word data. There's nothing wrong with data being really profitable or, or really effective. It's just, it needs to be spread around so that profit, that, that control, can be in, in many more hands. Um, and that's really the, the, uh, the key thing. Uh, to do this, just like we do with finance, just like we do with land, just like we do with labor, uh, there need to be new institutions uh, to make this happen. So things we have to uh, uh, guarantee with data are digital identity. What is the data about you? That's your digital identity and ownership rights, ability to know about it, control it. You don't have uniform uh, ownership of it because much of it's co-created, uh, but you at least have some rights in that. You have the ability to audit and accountability and GDPR and the California law are steps in this direction. And we work with a number of people to actually make this real and I'll mention that a little later on. 
And of course, if you screw up, that people do bad things, they ought to, you know, pay for it in one way or another. And too often that doesn't happen now, or only happens in trivial ways. So um, how to do this? Well, there's history here. In the 1870s, uh, most of America was rural. They felt they were being uh, raked over the coals by banks, local banks. There was no federal bank at that point. And, and uh, what they did is they formed agricultural uh, banks that they owned and they controlled. And uh, that resulted in this sort of political pushback. Uh, and eventually we got banking laws and the Fed and the whole nine yards, which, which cleaned up a lot of it. In the 1900s, 1920s, uh, the same was true of labor as industrialization came in because the people were moving off the land into cities. Uh, there was this feeling like a few big corporations controlled everything and exploited labor. So people formed into local uh, collectives called data uh, unions, sorry, not data, called unions, and they pushed back. And over time, the government got involved and uh, new sort of standards were established about, you know, how much you work and safety and things like that. And I think the same thing is beginning to happen and will happen in data. So people coming together uh, to make what I'll call data unions. You could also call them data cooperatives. Uh, <clears throat> but um, the idea here is, is that under current law, things like uh, uh, credit unions and cooperatives can hold data for people. So not own it, but usually deposit it, the same way you deposit money in a bank. And that if they do that, they can then, quote unquote, invest it for you. Uh, and that investment is not really about money. So there have been a number of things where people talk about, oh, I want money for my data. Well, excuse me, but that's stupid. It's a couple hundred bucks a month at most. It's actually more like a couple hundred bucks a year. But I would like to know that the hospital system is treating my community right and that my kids will survive, right? Or that I'll survive the pandemic. And a lot of times that's not true because I don't know what's happening about service delivery in my area. I don't know that the government is treating me right. I don't know that all sorts of things about my circumstance. And if I aggregate data, I can begin to determine what's happening to me and the people nearby. Did the school work? Is, the, is it a safe environment, et cetera, et cetera, and begin to push for, for change based on the facts. But you can't do that unless you have the data. So that's the core idea, is, is this notion of empowering communities by having them collect their data, not give their data up. And these data unions may eventually act as brokers and actually have monetary res uh, return, but I don't think that's the major uh, uh, value of these. So, let me just sort of illustrate a little bit about why you should care and the investment financial side of it. So, um, you know, what we're talking about is within a community, people uh, deposit their data. And this is trivial from an IT point of view. You just have a feed off your phone, off your Mint uh, account, things like that, to a bank, credit union, a co-op that holds it for you and helps you administer your data. And it, what it lets you do is make measurements about your community and how you do relative to your community and how the big powers in this world are treating your community. And we have a simple example of this that we're doing for Adelaide in Australia. If you look at opportunity.mit.edu, and it just shows things like, well, okay, for people in this neighborhood, where do they work? Where do they shop? How much money do they spend? What about their health? Is this something that uh, is a, a very diverse community or is it not? And that matters. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit more about the data that we're collecting there and the data that we're using for several other things, which I'll mention. It's really much like census data. So you deposit individual level data that's aggregated and you can say, that, well, here's the average income. Here's the rate of breast cancer. Here's the how the kids are doing in school. And so you get statistics about your 
census block, your community. And one of the things that's different than government statistics today is that you can also do flows of people. Those are things like where do the people in your community work? Um, how much do they work? How do they get there? What, who comes to your community to buy things? That's another sort of important thing. So again, it's like census data. It's not individual level data. But let me show you some of the things that you can do once you know the statistics about your community and the flows between communities. So for instance, in four continents, we've looked at many different cities. It turns out that the biggest predictor of year-on-year -year economic growth for communities, I'm not talking about the whole country, for a neighborhood, a census block, is the diversity of people that visit that community. And that's almost equivalent to the diversity of stores and other amenities. What that's telling you is, is that if you want to make a neighborhood richer, you have to have diverse amenities and you have to have the transportation to bring diverse sorts of people there. And if you do that with extremely high likelihood, the GDP earned in your neighborhood will go up. Uh, in fact, you can do something that's really pretty amazing. You can do estimation of sales for stores that don't exist. And you can do it as accurately as if the store had already been there. So let me break that down. So we can say, using this sort of flow data, say, if I put, a, say, a, a, a small food store or bodega or something right here, what will the sales be three months or a year out? And we can do that as accurately as a current store can with its historical data. But what that does is that gives you uh, financial viability of different investments. And in fact, we, if we combine this with historical data in some cases, or other sorts of data, uh, you can do considerably better than is possible today. So that's pretty interesting for investment. Um, and as I mentioned, there's this opportunity website. Um, we've shown that you can do things like identify poverty, hot spots. You can do better, much better design of transportation systems. So for instance, in Senegal, we showed that you could make the, the transportation system work something like 10 to 15% better with zero additional cost. You just rerouted the buses and things uh, to actually match demand. Uh, you can do public health, something that would have been uh, a great thing to have had about a year ago. Uh, and you can do investment and do much better job at predicting where investments will pay off and where they won't. So, uh, and here's one that's particularly relevant. It turns out you can predict surges in COVID. So where, which is going to be a hot spot next week, two weeks from now. You can do really a surprisingly good job of that. Uh, all things you might care about more than a couple hundred bucks a year. So what are we beginning to do? Well, first of all, probably half of you or more are saying, well, this is all nice, but this is some idealistic idiocy. Um, so I'll just point out to you that 56% uh, of the electric grid in the United States was not built by a government. It was not built by power companies. It was built by cooperatives. As in, these are... Uh, America's electric cooperatives. Community said, hey, that electricity stuff's pretty good. Let's put together a cooperative to build it, pay it off, and maintain it. And that's where most of the electric grid in America came from. You can imagine doing the same thing for internet. Why not, right? Um, we work with other things. So we work with the Credit Union National Association. Uh, so. What these are is these are credit unions that are have a, a mission of being beneficial for their community. They're local. They're not like the big broad inter, uh, national ones. And we can help them make better, much better loan decisions if they can get their members to contribute data to help the investments that they make, which is obviously going to have a dual bottom line. First of all, their neighborhood's going to get better because they may have even more diverse amenities, but also the interest that's paid on their money, not just their data, but on their money, will be better. 
We're working with consumer union to be able to um, verify digital claims and give people rights to their data. We're working with uh, various sorts of unions, including sort of gig workers, uh, because it's crazy. Gig workers are fully digital. The data is there on their phone. Um, why can't they tell what they're getting paid and, and, and what the situation is? And when the black box algorithm changes, why can't they tell what's going on? Well, it turns out that you can scrape that data off of their phone and tell how they're being paid and what's going on. And uh, they have the legal right to that also. So one of the things I set up recently, you might be interested, is law.mit.edu. So that's an alliance of law schools that think about computational law. How do you actually update law and make uh, law more adaptive and more suited to these digital things? And a final one I'll mention is Open Music. So this is an alliance with many uh, 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 musicians, music schools, and some music producers uh, to create a blockchain system uh, that where people can log their data, in this case, their performance data, it's their music, along with copyright info, and automatically license data directly without going through a lot of the, the normal distribution channels. Or you could if you wanted to, of course. Um, but it's, it's the sort of thing that promises to really revive the uh, recording and the video industry. Um, so enabling this, is not difficult. You can do this with an Excel spreadsheet and uh, a local survey, but you can also do it in a sort of a high-tech way. And we've designed systems like our trade coin system. You can see that it was uh, uh, featured in the Royal Society proceedings recently. Uh, but recently we helped the Swiss set up something called Swiss Trust Chain. So this is a blockchain system, a little bit like Libra, uh, but for managed by the Swiss, so you can trust it, right? uh, put up by Swisscom and Swiss Post uh, to be able to manage uh, digital rights, digital transformation. So that's medical, it's financial, ETFs, things like that, uh, uh, ownership, shares, all sorts of things uh, on this fully digital auditable program. Uh, we also work with the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and this is very interesting. Um, so their sovereign wealth fund has invested in creating a similar facility uh, for use by its investments in the Indian Ocean area. So Temasek has almost a trillion dollars worth of investment out in that area, and they're hoping to move all those logistics chains, the, the various sorts of uh, financial things, to this new uh, uh, facility, which is called Ubin. So look it up, Singapore, Ubin, and see what you think. Um, so that's it. I have a book about this, which uh, Arnold talked about, uh, Building a New Economy. Um, it's a work in progress at MIT Press, which means it's on the web and it's free. So you can go look at it if you want. Uh, and it'll be on Kindle in a couple months. Uh, the spell checkers have to go through it and stuff like that. So I'll just stop there and let's talk. Thanks. Great, that's a great introduction. I really appreciate it. And I see a lot of very, uh, um, enthusiastic uh, um, inquiries coming through the chat box too. So um, one thing that is uh, certainly very relevant, uh, one of the uh, attendee point out is that the uh, different data have varying the, amount of uh, quality depending on the metro collections and uh, uh, different provenance and uh, consistency issue. Um, what, what would you say is a good way to address um, these type of data quality issues? Well, in the things that we've done, um, you know, it's not quite the same problem you get in a company um, because in a company you're trying to do some often very complicated internal transaction data or customer data. Mostly what we're looking at are outcome data. So, you know, what what are the, you know, three geo codes that have the most purchasing of the people in this cooperative, in this neighborhood? Or uh, what are the uh, 
the zip codes of the people that purchase things in this uh, this neighborhood, or you know how often do the people in this neighborhood visit the hospital, and you can get data like that with extremely high accuracy. Uh, uh, yeah, there's always some bugs and stuff like that, but it's not a uh, it's not a major problem, at least in in our experience. So I see the a question about HIPAA, right? So remember that we're not giving data away. What we're doing is we're saying we have a repository where you can put data like your medical data, which is HIPAA covered, and store it there. And I saw a comment by somebody else who has a, a startup like that, My Life Data or something. Um, so that's entirely legal. You control that data. You can get a copy of it. Sometimes that's difficult, but you can get a copy and you can put it there. And then you can agree, just like a, a research uh, study, to have people answer certain questions about the aggregate data and make visible things like how often is there breast cancer in this neighborhood. So for instance, in, there's a neighborhood in our area where uh, somebody did that and they discovered that the weed killer that the grass guys were using caused breast cancer and there was a higher than usual uh, incidence of breast cancer in their their neighborhood. Well, that's pretty amazing. You'd like to know that, right? Um, but it's only possible by um, collecting data that's normally not in the possession of a of a community. I also, sort of point out that there's a couple things here that I didn't mention. One is is that uh, data driven investment, local investment, is a lot more can be a lot more lucrative and reliable than heuristic things, which is the way it's typically done. Um, the other sort of thing is, is that the, uh, the handling of the data here is well within existing laws. Uh, it, you, know, you might get some challenge sometimes, uh, but you're on the side that's going to win. And data is worth a lot more when it's in aggregate than it is when uh, it's individual level data. So by having these repositories, you can get much more leverage at all sorts of things um, than if you have only isolated individuals who aren't coordinated. Hey, uh, Professor, uh, let me uh, use my <laughs> moderator privilege to ask you a question I'm thinking about. The, um, some of these local community development ideas you have kind of reminds me of many of the um, uh, local economic um, currency that people have tried in different, different mm -hmm. areas, things like the Ithaca dollars and you know, with the idea of trying to preserve and maintain capital accumulation circulation within the community. Uh, I see some similar spirit in, in um, uh, these data unit work you're, you're working on. The, uh, do you feel that yeah, they're are called alternative currencies and um, you know the most famous and successful one is called the VIR, W-I-R in Switzerland. It's created during the Great Depression. Landowners in uh, Western Switzerland uh, pledged assets to support an alternative currency that could be used for projects to build infrastructure in Western Switzerland. So they sort of bootstrapped themselves. And that currency is still going on. It was a very successful way for them to get through the Depression and through uh, World War II. Uh, and it's still useful to them. The thing about something like that is, is that it's more complicated to set up than what I'm talking about. You have to bootstrap the currency. Typically, that requires local government to do things like demand that taxes be paid partially in the local currency. You have to advertise about it. Um, this is this just requires people to click on a button to get some software to have their their data account. It can be with an existing institution like a credit union that they already trust. Um, and then the part that's difficult about this is you have to have people that analyze the data uh, on the basis of what the community wants. You want to have sort of democratic governance of that. Uh, and what we're seeing is we're seeing, I'm seeing, people like uh, Consumer Union, a number of large investment firms, and a number of banks and other entities are uh, gearing up to provide those sorts of 
facilities to enable communities to make better investments. I mean, they're going to put the seed money in, so they'll get good return on investment, and they'll probably end up charging for this management of community data. But they don't own the data, and uh, uh, it's in their interest to make it as simple as possible. I've talked to the heads of several major banks and several major uh, who have all these quite useless bank branches, right? And I'm trying to figure out what are we going to do, right? And I did mention all the, the community credit unions who are also looking for things to do. And of course, labor unions are looking for things to do. I think we have a uh, question from uh, Travis. Hi there. Yeah. Hi, hi, Professor. Thanks for your time today. Um, I'm curious if you have worked at all with Tim Berners-Lee's solid project. It was at sure. MIT until I think 2015. Uh, the yeah. personal online data stores feel like a really interesting primitive for data unions. I'm just curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah, you could do that. That's actually, um, I'm generally, so the thing about uh, solid, so this is a way of building the web where you've got linked to data. Um, the, the weakness of that is that the semantics of all of the links have to be uniform. Otherwise, you've got garbage links, right? Uh, and so it's very hard to do out of existing data stores. But if you were building a new structure, it's great, right? So for instance, I think what you just said is, is, a, is a great use of it because you can, by setting it up, guarantee that the semantics of the columns are what you intended them to be. And then it gives you this secure, private, uh, controllable way of managing the data. Uh, so there's two types of general approach there. I don't know if you guys are interested in this. There's, there's that sort of thing where you do it uh, by design, so the semantics are right, and then there's the other sort of more machine learning thing that's referred to as federated learning, where you can tolerate a lot more noise and, and use pre-existing data stores. Uh, but you're not actually taking data out of the data store. Great, thank you so much. I believe uh, Mary has a question for you. I mean, it's Karen, sorry. Hi, yeah, again, Professor Pentland, thanks for being here. Um, so I, my husband actually brought this up when you were talking about the analogy to um, the electricity grid, that oh. he's from rural Texas. We still have a lot of family in Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas. And, you know, when phones were new, there were party lines, and pretty soon AT&T came in and sort of took everything over, and there was a lot of um, resource capture sort of legislation that helped AT&T take over. In the case of Electric Grid, my understanding it was similar. It's still really frustrating now that broadband is terrible. You're like standing on your car in the middle of town trying to get a cell signal, which is, it's sort of amazing the small companies haven't come in. Well, I think what's happened is small companies have come in, but then there's sort of lobbying from the majors and different pressure that they remove the smaller companies from the rural areas. And so extending the analogy, the question is here, there's a lot of existing players that are using data and sort of like the way things are running. And so sort of what's the legal oom for, what's the path to protecting any nascent effort that does provide people the ability to join data unions and prevent it from sort of being squashed by resource capture. Yeah, so those, those are great questions. So the, um, the there's probably two answers to this. One is, I think, you know, what's probably going to happen, which is that um, this is fundamentally political, just like labor unions and labor law. I mean, there was huge resistance to having rules about labor and safety and things like that. And, uh, you know, it was a battle. But the thing that uh, tipped it eventually was is you got enough citizens joining enough uh, entities, these unions or whatever, the government had to pay attention. And they passed laws despite the lobbying from the other side. And obviously, it was sort of a, a big battle. Uh, probably the same type of thing needs to happen now. Uh, so, so there are already uh, cooperatives and, and things like that that are you know, it's in their courts, in their charter. They're they're often, uh, uh, you know, determined. That's why they're there, to advocate for the community. Right now, communities have no way to advocate because they don't know anything about their data, their situation. 
if they can show value for that, if they show up at the state house or whatever, the, the city hall, um, they can begin to be heard on a factual basis. So it's not just opinion, it's, it's something that's harder, much harder to ignore. In the long run, um, you talk about AT&T and people like that, um, one of the big issues right now is antitrust regulation for, say, Google, et cetera, right? And we just uh, had a paper that was in the National Academy and uh, on that and showing that um, the way people are talking about antitrust today won't work. Right? This is not like breaking up Standard Oil, which was a localized business, uh, had ties to the physical world. Uh, now the, the network benefit, network synergy, means that if you break up Google, you're going to get two companies that are nearly as big and the problem is going to be worse. What you need to do is you need to uh, encourage the grassroots and competition. And there's several ways to do that. One is stop aqua hires, right? And, and certain sorts of uh, competitive merging, which is, of course, you know, like one of my former students has bought something like 350 companies for Google. So, no, don't do that. Right? Don't allow that. I'm sure he'll be disappointed, but, you know. Um, it's trying to shape the entire ecosystem so the ecosystem's much more competitive. There are other ways to do it which are more controversial in this country. Um, so, for instance, the OECD is looking at a digital tax. So, uh, if you have uh, customers in a country but no physical presence, often you can avoid taxes. Uh, but somebody still has to pay for the hospitals and somebody still has to pay for the roads. and and somebody still has to pay for the schools. And that's the motivation around a tax that's rely, uh, attached to, uh, to digital services. And that's going to be a big battle. But you can imagine that um, if, you, if your company doesn't pay taxes, sort of a reasonable amount of taxes, where your customers are, that, that that's a problem. And, uh, and what that would do if you implemented that type of a thing is that local companies, uh, which already pay tax through uh, employees and things like that, would be have cheaper services locally, uh, and locally might be your whole state, right? And, and they could have a chance to grow into some sort of real company before they had to compete with the big guys. So there's a couple things like that. Tax policy, which is more like what the OECD is doing this uh, uh, reducing uh, purchasing of competitive small companies. Um, you know, these are these are difficult problems, but those are some of the ideas that that we've come up with. Do you give any examples of medical data unions that are already out there and operating? There are some. Um, they suffer from a couple different things. Um, you know, patients like me, for instance, has done a really bang up job for rare diseases, I think. Uh, the main, and what that points to is, is that one of the main problems is you need to have a good sampling of the population to be able to say anything definite. So if you're looking at a rare neurological disease, you, you know, people are highly motivated to sign up and, and you get enough of the fraction of the patients that you can actually say things that are, are uh, you know, provably significant, right? That the medical associations have to pay attention to. You can also do things that are population health, though. If I could get 10% of the people even in a neighborhood, I could talk about prevalence of diabetes, I could talk about prevalence of cancer, I could talk about, and that's enough to begin to really have arguments about uh, public health services and other sorts of things. And, um, but it's a sample, at the end, it's a sampling problem. You have to get a, this is the same thing with all sort of data analytics. You have to get enough of a sample to be able to know that you can make a firm statement about something. That's my view on it. There are some other problems, like for instance, why doesn't data for drug trials get aggregated? Well, it's because different people own the drug trials. But there are now mathematical techniques for combining that data. So, for instance, one of the efforts I'm involved in is getting an Alzheimer's drug. 
because there's enough data out there to really have strong statements about what works and what doesn't work, but it's in different hands. And everybody doesn't want yeah, to get up to that work. point. One of the issues that comes up is compliance. If you look at alltrials.com, they go on and bemoan the fact that all this money is being given by governments for clinical trials and none of the results are being reported. If you go right. to clinicaltrials.gov, for example, and click the reported data tab, it's empty for a large number of the things that are there. Yeah, it's crazy, right? And, and, and again, that has to do with sort of data rights. If you're part of a trial, you ought to, there ought to be a way you can log all that stuff. And similarly, they don't log um, interactions very well at all, even after the thing's approved. Uh, so it's like there's crazy stuff. And, and I think that, that we could do so much better if we had just a little bit of sensible uh, regulation, but also this sort of uh, uh, consumer-centered aggregation. I'll say consumer, but because uh, I don't want to say patient, because you know we're all going to be patients someday. Uh, you know we want to put that off as long as possible. Um, I believe that Kathy has a uh, question. You mute yourself, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, it is very much related to I uh, guess some of the discussions that uh, Kay Robinson brought up about um, you know large companies moving in and also with the idea that um, when you talk about how powerful this data is i really see the attraction of data unions um and also the need to have like the need to have aggregated data like data is much more powerful for decision making if you have more of it and people are cooperating but um one of the concerns i have and i wonder if, um what your thoughts are are on this is how do you address the lack of trust that will tend to develop between these individual data unions? Like, will they actually have issues where they will not want to share their data with other, you know, little data fiefdoms and say, you know, we're not sharing because we don't trust you enough to do the right thing with our data or because you're undervaluing our data? I'm a little worried about these frag sure. the fragmentation and creation of data silos in a different way. Right. So so one of the things, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with federated learning. You don't actually have to share data. In fact, if you are doing something that involves sharing data, you've probably made a mistake. Um, what you can do is you can do local computations that produce uh, essentially feature vectors that cannot be related back to individuals. And then you can aggregate the feature vectors to be able to get global insights. Um, the most brilliant version of this is it runs on your cell phones where you know, there's this thing called swipe, which is how you type really, really fast on a phone. And, and that's updated by, there's a little local machine learning, produces a feature vector. They then randomly flip the bits in the feature vector, so it's junk. They send it to home some central place, and it turns out if you add all of those feature vectors up, the noise cancels out. So now you can say, what was the average, you know, performance of these phones uh, across, and they do this for hundreds of millions of phones, right? Uh, quite regular. You say, what was the average performance, but provably there's no way to know what was happening on any particular phone. And then you, what mm. you do is you send updates to the average performance back to the phones. And so nobody knows whether you're using that even, right? So there are ways of doing this that are um, sort of not the way humans normally think about things. And I think that that's uh, uh, sort of a, a great hope. The other thing is, you know, like for instance, credit unions in, in this con country, uh, they invest in pools. So the entire Northeast, every credit union has the same pool, uses the same pool of investment. They use uh, the same type of software, uh, you know, because they're too small to do anything big by themselves. And so they get not money from it, but they get expertise and management from it, All right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a path forward and you're good to worry about that. But, but I think that um, that's, that's pretty directly um, 
addressable. Especially if you, I mean, if you start with high trust uh, entities, right, like credit unions and things like that. And I know they're a little tired <coughs> and so forth. I know there's problems with them, right? Some of them are sold out, etc. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have okay, two more uh, good question coming up. Uh, since just a reminder, buddy, that we're coming near the end of the hour, please ask a question quickly. Um, Mr. Jason Dunlop, can you please ask a question? Uh, thank you uh, for the presentation tonight. It's great to uh, join in from the UK uh, over in Wales. Uh, great to see different paradigms and different views. I just wonder if you've done any work on the future value of uh, personal data and how you see that world growing, changing or staying as it is. So, um, well, if you're interested in it, we have an article in Sloan Management Review about data exchanges. So one of the problems with data today is that there's no really good market way to value it. Um, I mean, independent of who controls it, who gets the value, um, you know, is it surveillance or what, you know, uh, you can't really discover the value. And uh, what we've seen, what I'm seeing is the rise of these things which do not share data, but allow insights to be computed on the data, which is essentially what I'm talking about with, uh, with a cooperative. So um, what you do is if you wanna know something, uh, uh, you go to one of these exchanges and you say, I'd like to know this, here's the algorithm I wanna run on the telco data and the other sort of data. And they look through it and make sure it doesn't violate any privacy laws or things like that. Um, and because it's a sort of competitive type of a thing, you end up with markets and market mechanisms that value things. Um, and it, you know, so it's uh, it it allows uh, for much more fluidity and use of data in the aggregate. Uh, without endangering individual privacy. Now you have to be able to have governance of this. So, you know, you can imagine a world where it's all run by data and humans aren't involved, you know, our robot overlords. And, and obviously you need to have uh, rules about that. And we have some rules about that, but there need to be um, sort of institutions for managing that the way we manage our, uh, our uh, dollars and pounds, right? There's a central bank, there's people that look at inflation, there's people that look at fraud uh, and, and things like that. And, and it's going to take that because it's a means of production. It's a major factor in value creation. So people are going to do all sorts of crazy things and you got to make sure that they don't. Thank you. Uh, That's really insightful. Thank you. So next Let's keep it quick. The uh, a uh, Mr. Sumita Sandhu. Um, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. Thank you for taking the question. Um, the question is generally around climate and natural resources, right? So that's the biggest existential threat to the planet. Yet the data is still very siloed, right? The government opens it up, but then the Black Rocks and others are computing you know, risk and local risk and hyper-local risk, but nobody else has access to that. So how do we go about unsiloing it from those that have the bandwidth to compute insights? Well, I think there's, there's two types of uh, answer, Run. Um, I mean, let's, let me just point out that if, you know, there's a hundred million people that are members of um, uh, data, uh, sorry, Mon credit unions in the United States, if they also had their data, you could do really pretty amazing things because that's a good sample of the US. In terms of the sort of data you're talking about, um, it's a little bit like the drug discovery problem where there's these owners of data and they only let it out in certain ways that are high value for them and the rest of us just don't know what's happening. Um, so it's nice that there are now ways to compute things uh, that allow you to do uh, make statements about the aggregates or about um, not necessarily everything, but you could do it state by state or even 
in some cases city by city, um, where it doesn't reveal proprietary information or personal information and still be able to see what's going on. So, so the argument, oh, we can't share because it's proprietary or personal uh, is really quite weak now, just like it is in medicine. Uh, it's now it's just, you know, people want to own it. Uh, and what that argues is you need to have some sort of uh, regulation or standard about this. In, in many countries, uh, like Britain is one of the, the leading ones, there's a very strong open data regulation. And uh, they actually have the a law that allows them to seize data like that and make it public. And they haven't done much of that at all, but the law's on the books. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm a big believer in that sort of open data. There needs to be much more rich data about society, about sustainability and so forth. I'm on the board of directors for the UN Sustainable Development Goals data effort, which is exactly that. There ought to be sort of neighborhood by neighborhood measurements of all these sorts of things, poverty, inequality, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that ought to be for the whole world. And progress is being made, but of course it's slow and frustrating. The good news is that uh, because of various other pressures, uh, the OECD is proposing a, a very detailed version of the sustainable development data goals for companies and for tax authorities. Um, the big four accounting forms have, have uh, lobbied for and proposed very concrete measurements like what you're talking about because they have to be able to audit companies right and data is now being put on the books not off the books so and risks of those sorts are being built into the financial incentives so there's hope um i won't say it's a done deal but um just this morning for instance i was uh 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 the conclusion of this uh, set of meetings that I've been running for this is I, I think this is slightly hilarious. There's turns out there's a club, which is all the former presidents and prime ministers in the world. Right? It's called the World Leadership Alliance. Who knew? Right? And and they get together and have policy discussions. And I was leading the discussion on digitization. And this is exactly the sort of topic that they're talking about and and there was really sort of an overwhelming feeling that what we need is something that's very much like Bretton Woods so at the end of World War II there was these Bretton Wood Accords that set up the UN and the International Monetary Fund and and there's really very strong feeling uh, among the world leaders around the UN around the OECD uh, World Economic Forum that there needs to be a new digital uh, uh, Bretton Woods to be able to set up governance for all this patchwork of crazy data systems because they're now central to governments responding, to being able to know what to do, uh, to tax, to investment, and, uh, and there's no coherence to them. Yeah, and, and the EU is um, already ahead of us. Well, the EU is uh, already moving towards that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so in my phone of time, we'll give the last question to Mr. Chef Malik. Um, please keep it to one, the one most important question you might pose. Yeah, no, thank you, Professor Penton, for that. Um, so I'm from Streamer, and uh, we also built some open source software called Data Union. So it's a data union framework, so people can do this stuff generically. Um, so just a quick question would be this, on, on that topic of, of law, um, do you think that the single silver bullet could be something like uh, the sort of redefining portability rules. Um, so they're in real time and they become single click rights. So people can just take their data from existing platforms like Spotify or Netflix or whatever and just stick it into a data union collective. Yeah, so so um, a lot of existing law, like in California and in, in Europe, actually has that as something that's required, but it turns out it doesn't work hardly no. at all. <laughs> What you need there is sort of uh, both legal and political pressure. So we're working with uh, some of the big alliances um, to set up legal challenges to enable that. 
right? Uh, and under these existing laws. And then the other thing is this political thing. You need to be able to say, you know, lots and lots of people, citizens, people who vote, pay taxes, really want to have this happen. And, mm -hmm. and then guess what? They might actually listen, right? So, so those two prongs are, are the ways to do it. I don't think many of these things are not purely technical problems. They have to do with politics and socio systems and stuff like that. Great. Thank you so much, Wolf. That's a very, very interesting and stimulating um, sort of QA. Wish we had a, a lot more time. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, uh, before we sign off, I just want to do a quick intro for the people that are uh, not familiar with the Asian Financial Society. It's been a professional organization based off of uh, people working on Wall Street. And uh, we do a lot of educational events. We just finished a whole summer series of uh, training for people um, joining uh, in the early careers uh, in the uh, financial uh, world. And um, last week, we just had a commercial real estate um, uh, panel discussion. And um, uh, also, we run a um, fintech competition called the Alpha Award. Uh, that uh, introducing startup to um, different possible uh, venture capitalists or, or other potential corporate investors uh, to help them uh, develop their uh, own, own uh, new venture. So uh, I put in the, some of the website um, information the, in the chat box. So feel free to uh, um, use that and uh, uh, take a look to keep track of our future programming and so forth. Um, and next, let me turn it back over to um, Jason, uh, who will uh, highlight. Just want to do uh, th thanks, Arnold, and, and thanks for organizing this. Uh, so this was this event was co co sponsored by the MIT Club of New York and the Asian uh, Financial Society in in I'm sorry, uh, MIT Club of Northern California, and then AFS out there in New York. And uh, Arnold, who's also an MIT CNC member, even though he lives out of state, so. Uh, just want to, want to kind of get our reach out there. Like we're here to, to bring the, the community together, uh, share ideas. So uh, thanks again for organizing a great event, Arnold and Professor Pentland, appreciate you coming out here. And uh, hopefully everybody, you guys will uh, keep checking out more of our events. Um, and uh, thanks for your time today. Great Stay year. tuned for more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.